Hello, and welcome to Fish Wrap Episode 6. Today's date is February 19th, 2021, and we're looking at sunny but frozen weather outside here in Blue Earth, Minnesota. As always, I'm your host, Janie Hansen. This week's episode is sponsored by Croptomize and hosted by the Rural Renaissance Project. In today's episode, we're going to cover the markets, ag tech, and alternative farm financing. As usual, I'm joined with Q Lair, our resident market expert and advisor, and pleased to present this week our guest, Amber Christian, founder of Wonderly Software Solutions and creator of Bellasina, a new software to help improve meetings. How are you today, Amber? I'm excellent and excited and nerd out about farm finance today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Amber and I met um, you know, both being female founders, tech entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and investors, as well as little known fact, we are both farm gals. Absolutely. So, so excited to talk about you know the markets, what's, what's happening in soybeans, and then get into what does the future of farming and technology and, and finance look like. So Q, what's happening this week? <laughs> well, uh, Thanks, Janie. And here we are again, uh, bean market dominating the grain markets again. Um, the uh, clash of the titans between the commercials and the funds continues. Um, it is quickly turning into a war of attrition uh, as we head deeper and deeper into the crop year. Uh, we, we've got the commercials have had no change whatsoever in their, in their net position in the shorts and the funds, you know, continue to press. But the, the commercials, of course, have the stocks to really force this issue. Uh, we've had the March options are off the board. March futures are going into first notice next week. So the clock is definitely ticking on these guys on the longs. Uh, also, uh, we've had the first boat leave Brazil, a new crop this year. Um, the FOB to FOB is uh, Brazil's 90 cents under the Gulf. So what that means is that uh, Brazil FOB grain, it, uh, soybeans is priced 90 cents cheaper than what is in New Orleans. So in other words, uh, you know, the commercials are not going to move. They haven't budged. You know, commercial commercial traders just came out a few minutes ago. Their net position is is virtually unchanged. And the the old crop, of course, is liquidating quickly because March is going off the board. All we got left is May, July, Augie and Sep for for old crops. So, you know, we're losing these futures. The clock is ticking and we'll see what happens. Uh, You know, corn, of course, is... uh, you know, the war is going on there. It's much, much bigger game, but yet there's plenty of room, you know, especially in our frames. Uh, we've also got a situation where uh, the uh, USDA just came out with their outlook for the year. They're looking at 92 million acres of corn, 90 million acres of beans, which is considerably larger than what we had last year. Um, I think they're 2 million short on each. I, I got my ASS chewed out on Twitter for saying that. <laughs> and... But I'll bet anybody 10 bucks and I'm right. So anyway, we, we will see in the fullness of time come, you know, at least the March uh, prospective plantings. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, inflation is, is starting to rear its head. Uh, we're seeing some problems in, in several markets like copper and silver. Um, we're also, you know, it's like every week there's some freaking disaster <laughs> in the markets. I mean, from GameStop to, you know, whatever. Last week... Uh, we had a situation where ERCOT, which is uh, uh, the, the uh, Texas oil grid or Texas electric grid, uh, was trading 30 bucks a megawatt. Next day, it was 1600 Day after that, it was 11000 So, yeah, that was because they were having a little Minnesota weather down there in Texas? Must, must have been. <laughs> but, but it's also, you know, failure of the grid, failure of management. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, they get 110 degrees down there all the time. This can't be about their grid. So it's got to be something else. So there's going to be plenty of postmortem. You know, everybody is just yapping right now about what's going on. But, you know, the, the experts are saying that, that you know, it's, it's really the, the, the mix, the blend, and the pipes getting the stuff in and out of, of that. Because, you know, it's, it gets 110 down there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you never hear about the rolling blackouts like you do in, in California and Texas. Yeah, so back from my energy days, I used to uh, work in renewable energy, and usually it was the the negative price environment when there's too much wind on the wires and you had to curtail electricity. So, you know, I think the uh, renewables have been getting a bit of a bad rap for for this with the icing, um, Mm -hmm. you know, shutting down some of the wind turbines and and snow on the solar panels and stuff. But are renewables to blame or or what's going on there? Uh, Like I said, they're still doing the postmortems on this. You know, the experts that I watch, it's really about you know the pricing mechanisms at the moment to get stuff through you know through the pipes and get it get it done, 
but it's really about you know getting the coal fire and, and the natural gas uh, you know in, into the system to, yeah. for the backup when when these things do go down. Yeah. So is there problems on the natural gas side of things? Because that's usually the, the backfill. If, if, if there's some of the intermittent power goes down, you can fire up some of the, the gas plants. But was there a problem on the natural gas side? How is that possible in Texas, for Christ's sake? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Mm-hmm. It, it's like, you know, it, it's like, is there a shortage of basketball in Indiana? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our resident Hoosier. <laughs> well, it's it's like uh, you know this this was a debacle of epic proportions and and the thing is it was eleven thousand dollars bid with no offer I mean there was, no, there was just nothing to be had you couldn't you couldn't buy it mm-hmm. yeah but the reality is it was a system shock right in Texas I mean that was pretty catastrophic grid failure and even just following friends on Twitter that was probably my best source of news about the the power mm-hmm. grid failures I'm just watching what they were talking about and first it was the electricity then it was don't use natural gas and then the effect on water. So one of the things that I'm curious about is, you know, you go through these systematic shocks. What is any potential downstream ramifications for ag of this? Are there any? That's my, that'd be my question. You know, we, the only problem we have in ag right now at the moment is, is, uh, is lack of snow cover in the Texas high plains on the, on the wheat crop. You know, that's the main problem we have right now because that's, that's the only thing that's really exposed. Uh, all the rest of the winter wheat has got good snow cover on it. Even with this deep Arctic blast we just had, you know, six, seven inches of snow on top of the wheat is, is just fine. Even in Russia is good, but uh, it's just bare out there in western Texas, up in the panhandle. And, you know, we're going to see how much is killed. We call it winter kill, mm-hmm. and we're going to see how much is killed there. Um, you know, drought is reaching its way a little bit into the Midwest, but, you know, the hardcore, you know, the I states are, are virtually, you know, drought problem free at the moment. So, you know, it, it's looking like we're going to have a solid crop, and and we'll see if we get it in on time. That's that's the key mm-hmm. at the and moment. I, and I think for on the livestock side, it would just depend on what they have for backup generation and and stuff there. So right, yeah. mm-hmm. I mean, hell, they've been you know feeding cattle in Wyoming and Montana for years. So mm-hmm. this is this is nothing new for cattle. So, well, thanks, Q. So, Amber, having talked about some of the grain markets and and mm-hmm. stuff, and bring back any childhood memories of farm farm time <laughs> absolutely we were we were talking even before the show a little bit about you know what what are some of your various memories of ag right and so i grew up on a farm you know so i was the youngest of four kids the only girl i'll leave you to surmise all kinds of things about that but uh, as i grew up went into college went into technology there and one of the big things i've noticed over the last 20 years the adoption of technology and ag is absolutely incredible I mean, I remember when one of my brothers went to work on the precision steering for tractors and when that was such a big thing and that was brand new and we're like, oh, old hat now, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, well, everybody has that. <laughs> but I remember watching it and seeing how much more precise and how much technology was being applied. And as a technologist myself and having spent the last 20 years now in technology and just watching this whole evolution. And one of the things that's interesting to me is how much farm financing has but hasn't changed over that 20 years. A number of years ago, my husband and I did our first farm bid. We uh, were buying some land. And now this was a number of years ago, so I'm probably dating myself a little bit. But the system used to manage the financing was put your bid in an envelope, and then they were all the sealed envelopes. And so then, you know, somebody's opening the envelopes at the end of the time, and I'm like, how archaic is this? You know, you work <laughs> in technology, and we're putting numbers in envelopes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my first land auction was not much different. It was about seven years ago, and, um, you know, it's... Yeah, some of that same like the bidding, and, and there are a number of different formats that you can have for that. But uh, but you know what's what's happened over my lifetime is the numbers have just gotten so much bigger in farming mm-hmm. from you know, when I was born, and and my parents were farming. Like I'm part of a fifth generation farm, so mm-hmm. you know I remember my dad telling me about when he went to his first land auction and you know rocked up with his motorcycle and leather jacket <laughs> and the, you know won the bid and the auctioneer's like can we trust this kid? Like, you know, is he going to be good for it? And then it's like, you know, you knew my grandpa, the other auctioneer knew my grandpa. It's like, yeah, that's, you know, part of the family, but you, you either, you know, you need to already have had that farming base or, you know, somebody mm-hmm. vouching for you or, or something to even have access to get in the game, let alone mm-hmm. like get started. So, mm-hmm. 
But yeah, but that, you know, when my brother and I went <laughs> first, it's like, woo, here we go. It's our, our first time jumping into the ring on this. But, because I think a, a misunderstanding on farming is like, th there's not small amounts here. Like it'll be a 40 acres kind of at a minimum that you could right. buy. And if land is, you know, seven to 10,000 an acre, you know, that adds up pretty quick. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then you get field sizes that are 80, 160 acres and, you know, the, the numbers have gotten bigger and, you know, input costs have gone up as the equipment mm -hmm. has gotten bigger and, and more of that auto steer precision ag technology. But, you know, I'm really curious to see on the, the financing and, you know, on the um, financial side of things, what innovations are going to mm -hmm. to help out. What does the future of farming look like? Absolutely. So I got curious and started doing some research as well. I'm so in full disclosure, I've got a finance MBA and I've worked in technology for the last 20 years. And I'm a Gen Xer that came off a farm. And I say, okay, I live in an urban area right now, but I'm very interested in what happens with the farm economy. My brother is a farmer, you know, multi-generational farm in the family as well. And I started thinking about, and I've read about for years, how hard it is to, um, well, first of all, to get into farming, the capital. It's insanity, right? The amount of capital that's required. And, and even going from one generation to the next. And then I thought, okay, put on your strategy hat. Like, how could you do this a little differently if you're first coming in? You can get a certain amount of financing, right? That to purchase land, assuming you can even get in, right? Yeah. When you have the vouch for and other system, but assuming you can even get into land, you can get a certain amount of capital financing, but there's only so much of that you can get. They will only, they'll only give you so much leverage. Mm -hmm. So then as a farmer, you only have so much to work with. You only have so many bushels you're going to work with. And then, like you said, you've got a certain amount of fixed costs, a certain amount of variable cost on your farm, right? And so we know that those fixed costs can get spread over more acres if you can get access to more land. But how do you finance it? Mm -hmm. That's the key, right? So I started digging. I thought, huh, anybody crowdsourcing in farming? Actually, I found someone. They call it crowd farming. Really? You heard it here first. <laughs> crowd, <like> crowd farming? <laughs> New term. Yeah. Haven't heard this Does before. Does that go with the farm glitch that we were talking I about on your podcast? So. Yes. A year ago? Yes. <laughs> if anybody that's watching doesn't know farm glitch, that is that sub dialect of farming English that nobody but anybody in the ag industry will understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as I got thinking about it, it's like, okay, well, I know that part of the key with farming is you have to get so big, right, to be able to spread those fixed costs over more acres. And so with some of this crowdsource financing, what they do is essentially allow smaller investors to be able to put up the capital. So instead of you having to come up for it and you're, you can only be so leveraged, you can go through these sites and smaller investors can invest. So like we talked about, right? You're talking a million plus in a lot of cases to get in. Um, I don't know about you, but most people don't have a million in cash sitting around to just plunk down yeah, on I land. I haven't found that in the couch cushions yet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Me either. That's not in the cushions. Yeah. And so you can come up with so much of it. But um, with some of these crowdsourcing things, what's interesting is the way they set them up. And so I had found one called Acre Trader. And what they do is they purchase the land, they put the land in an LLC, and then the farmer cash rents from them. Okay, and you think, okay, yeah, okay, fine, Amber. So that's all well and good, but that doesn't sort of solve that problem. So then I said, okay, let's take this a step further. All right, so I'm a farmer. I've bought so much land. I'm so levered. Then I've got some stuff through some of these alternate financing things where other investors can put up the money for it. And then I apply technology that helps me raise my revenue line. What would that be, Janie? Mm -hmm. It sounds a little <laughs> bit like a little something called Croptimize. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Q. <laughs> <laughs> helps to have a trader on your team. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I thought, okay, if you can then, you can start to lock in, you can start to know what you're going to be able to generate for revenue now you can take on a certain amount of these. The idea, is, it's not, the idea isn't that you're going to cash rent forever. Yeah. These, most of these deals, these are five or 10 year deals, and then they're going to sell the land. Well, guess who buys it at the end? 
farmer. The farmer that made so much money because they hedged their crops with Croptimize to provide the financing. Mm -hmm. So I looked at some of these crowdsourcing or some of these other equity type arrangements as interesting bridge financing once you get past some of the traditional financing. So that's the perspective I was coming from as I was doing my research on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in order to do that, you'd have to have a good handle on what's the cash flow look like for farming. How do you Mm -hmm. get beyond just this current year and start looking out, you know, you know, there's three years on the boards, you know, at, at the Board of Trade. So you can look ahead and start locking in prices when it's not just covering your cost of production, but when the market gives you that opportunity to lock in profit. So then you can really start taking that long term view. You know, these farmers already take the long term view because you're, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully farming year after year, same piece of land, you know, same soil. So you're wanting to make sure you're being a good steward of the land. But how do you make sure you've got the, you know, the financial? Um, stewardship as well. Exactly. And then you can take advantage of, okay, if, I, if I've if i locked in and mitigated and I, I, like I've covered as much of the cost as I can on this, then you can figure out what your risk tolerance is to take on more. You know, my dad always told me one of the lessons I took away, probably one of the best lessons he ever taught me, and he will be surprised that this was the lesson I walked away with, is he said, Amber, I didn't take enough risk. Really? I was really conservative. I should have taken more risks. So, and, and he told me that at some point when I was in college. And so I made sure I took more risks in my career and things I did and all that. Cause I thought, huh, cause we come from this naturally super, super conservative place. Right. Mm-hmm. And how do we balance that? And so I'm all about how do you create safety so that you can take strategic risk, the risks that make sense. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes those might be expanding a little bit with the idea that you can go that much further so many years down the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's where at different points in your career and depending on where you're at with your operation and and you know and what you've built up, it, it's different. So that's where me just starting to get into managing my own risk for the farm mm-hmm. is different than what it would be for my dad or, you know, different for my brother who's got, you know, he's the farmer <laughs> managing the operating side and agronomy side of things. You know, I'm mm-hmm. more on the financial side of, of things, but that's where, you know, so I would probably be a little bit more conservative in locking some of my early year cash flows just to make sure I've got my bases covered right. and, you know, get some money in the bank, you know, working with the bank and saying, yep, I'm being a good, you know, I'm taking advantage of the market opportunities right. when they're there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for example, um, I was talking last week about making my first trade on soybeans. Yeah. <laughs> so, because um, to date, or like when I was growing up, we would do the uh, cash grain sales. So you see a, a price posted at your elevator and, you know, contract ahead. So, you know, like when the, the prices for soybeans have been where they are, I'm looking at the elevator and they've got the price posted for November 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I looked at that this year, the basis, uh, which is the difference between what's posted at the Board of Trade and then each location um, where mm-hmm. grain is bought or sold, um, there's a basis, which is basically like a local supply supply demand cost. Um, but yeah, the basis was much lower than it usually was. So that's where I made the decision, like, all right, now it's time to to get in the game, you know, I'll lock in the futures at the board and then I'll wait to lock in my basis until later. And, um, you know, cause we were 80 under for, um, around here and it's, it's narrowed back more into the normal range. It's about 40 under now, but, um, so just managing that risk, you put 40 cents a bushel in your pocket. Yeah. That's, that's a nice start to the year. You know, it's helps when you can put a little bit in your pocket before you even put the seed in the ground. <laughs> We well, feel better about putting the seed in the ground when you know there's going to be something in the pocket, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but that's where you know starting to look ahead because honestly, growing up, I didn't know you could sell, you know, three years ahead. So that was mm-hmm. that was a new learning for me and in, in talking with Q about how I manage the pricing risk on my farm. So, mm-hmm. you know, how was it for for you growing up? What were the uh, grain marketing conversations around the dinner table? I remember a lot of little pink elevator slips that would come home. I'm pretty sure they were pink. I mean, there might have been some yellow ones in there as well. But, you know, I'll be very honest. A lot of it went right over my head because I didn't really understand a lot of what it meant. And it wasn't, I think, until I got older that I realized, well, I'd actually absorbed more than more than I realized I absorbed. I, I thought I wasn't listening. Apparently, I was <laughs> more than I realized. Um, but I think too, 
one of the biggest challenges is, you know, just access to the information and being comfortable with what does it mean. And it means having to adopt a whole new skill set. You know, farmers, you know, a lot of times they say, well, I'm just a farmer. And like, no, actually, you're a businessman. You just happen to steward land as well. And I think of that very, very differently. And so I, I, so I say, well, where'd you get your entrepreneurship? From my dad. He's a farmer. And people look at you and they're like, no, you don't understand what farmers have to know. <laughs> they're running a business. Mm-hmm. It, it's not just as simple as put the seed in the ground and it's all fine kind of thing. This is a whole business and there's this entire set of skills. And it's right. gotten very, very sophisticated. And that's where it gets challenging. How do you embrace taking advantage of the technologies that the big guys are using yeah. when you're a small farmer so that you can still remain viable and that family farm is going to be around to go to the next generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked about that recently where um, 25, 30 years ago, all you had to do was worry about the United States. And now you got Brazil in the game, Russia in the game, Argentina in the game, Australia. And Australia just had the second biggest wheat crop ever. Yeah, those mm-hmm. fundamentals have changed. Everything's changed. Because growing up, Brazil didn't produce hardly any soybeans at all. Now they produce more than us. So that's where, you know, it used to be, was there a drought in Illinois? How is that going to affect our price here? And now you have to look you know, around the world mm-hmm. to and, and understand those dynamics. So, you know, but what I think is interesting with technology is, you know, on the, on the mechanical and, and precision ag side of things, um, farming used to be a lot more physically demanding. Mm-hmm. So that's where, like, me being female and you know, I'm older than my brother, so I used to be able to take him, but he's definitely stronger <laughs> than me now. Um, but there's some of the things that like, you know, I can do more things on the farm than you know, I would have been able to you know, 30 years ago. Um, but now it's applying those same sort of things on the uh, financial side. So, you know, I'm not a stats prodigy or, or market expert, but we have access to that. So it mm-hmm. can help me make some more farm decisions and be more confident and, and relieve some of the stress um, for me by leveraging technology. Mm-hmm. And even to the extent of, if we just think about it as people, our brains are only wired to handle so much complexity and only so many variables. That's something I think about a lot. And so you think about the the average farmer that, may have been managing just what's happening in the different regions of the U.S. and affecting the prices, but now all of the rest of the world, there's more variables than your brain can hold. Yeah. And that's where that's where technology can help, can help give you what are the what are the triggers and what's happening and what does that mean? And, and then the interpretation of it. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't try to do it anymore. It's just too much. Yeah, you well, that's right. You know, being able to, it's a global marketplace and you know, farms of any size are competing in the same places like as the big players, the Cargills and ADMs Mm -hmm. and and stuff like that. And they've got, you know, technology that's watching the market at all times, has access to all of this information, you know, the Mm -hmm. the computers and the AI, um, artificial intelligence doesn't sleep, doesn't forget. Mm -hmm. That and at the same time, for the little guy, the small farmer, what's really cool about how all of this has changed is you have access to these new mechanisms. Right. So I looked at like crowdsourcing for instance, you think, well, this whole cr- kind of crowd farming concept. So the SEC recently changed the rules where you used to only be able to raise a million dollars with crowdfunding. Now it's five. Wait a second, five million dollars crowdsourced could buy you a fair amount of land. So now you can get different types of deals, different types of arrangements in place. So it, it isn't all accredited investors only. Now, what if you could tap the rise of the retail investor that's fine putting money in farmland? Just think about that. If you had the means to manage all that, well, I think we should start a Reddit forum. Money in farmland. <laughs> Forget yeah. GameStop AMC, right? Yeah. <laughs> Farmland's where it's at. Yeah. So are you, how are you seeing the that intersection of um, that crowdfunding and, and stuff like that on the technology side, you know, for you mm-hmm. and your business, you're a tech founder and, and CEO. Mm-hmm. And you know, mm-hmm. how is that affecting your world? Well, the, the technology side of it related to some of the farm things, I think what's interesting is there's a few different sites. There's only a couple of these. We're very early mm-hmm. um, in this, in, in this generational things. And so there's this one I, I looked at called Acre Trader, where they actually let credit investors only um, buy in, and then they set a certain life of the deal, and then they can kind of cash out to that. But I think that evolution is just going to continue. I think we're going to see more and more of it. The other reality is there's a whole other aspect to this that we haven't touched on yet. 
And Janie and I are both tail end of Gen Z or Gen X, I should say, not Gen Z. Oh, we'd be, yeah, yeah. no, <laughs> yeah. Gen X. Uh, the reality is Gen Xers are coming into more money at this point in time. And that's why I bring up these alternate farm financing things. And so just as an experiment over a number of months, I've been asking around a lot of my other fellow Gen X or friends, you know, in, in some cases, if they've had kids, a lot of cases, they're heading off to college or they're getting close to college. And so they're coming into disposable income. You're like, ooh, wait a second. Mm -hmm. This now gets interesting. And say, so I start asking them, hey, anybody in your family have a farm? Oh, they would wax nostalgia all the time. Either my parents, my grandparents, my cousin, somebody farms in the Midwest. And so all of a sudden you start to think, huh, there's potentially a whole new investor base that isn't being tapped yet. Mm -hmm. Well, and ones where you can have access to some different types of deals, and I think there's you know, going to be more innovating on the finance mm -hmm. side of things, so you can make it more open and accessible to people while still having products that you know are not as high risk as you would expect. So of like how you protect the smaller investor, because that's where the you know, accredited investor rules are mm -hmm. there for a reason. Um, but you know, having things where people can invest locally, you know, whether it's in you know things directly related to farming or some of the you know tech, food, um, other healthcare, other adjacent mm -hmm. industries that and you know, now especially as we're seeing with uh, the worldwide shutdown working remote <laughs> and, and oh, how you absolutely. can develop and build these companies from anywhere and thankfully we've got entrepreneurs like you helping <laughs> make that <laughs> remote work life easier <laughs> so we'll shout out for a uh, wonderly software solutions and <laughs> meetbellasina.com so so yeah um any closing thoughts from either of you we're almost out of time you know i, I keep thinking about robin hood and how they ran laps around Wall Street and Washington, D.C. before they even figured out what happened. And, you know, I think this is this is what's coming. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. You know, they call it DeFi, which, you know, decentralized finance, mm -hmm. which, you know, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo was all trying to fight it and get it, you know, stuff put in it, put in the way of it as incumbents. But yet it was amazing how Robin Hood just did it before they even knew what happened. Right. And how does someone, you know, I look at it, technology can be really threatening, right? And mm -hmm. the, oh my gosh, it's going to disintermediate, it's going to blow everything up. Ah, but it can be advantageous mm -hmm. as well. And so I see a lot of positives in this. I see a lot of positives in this idea of the rise of the retail investor. Why couldn't that exist in some of these other areas? And that maybe that's part of the financing answer for newer farmers to get in. Yeah. So I see a lot of hope in the way it's changing if we can get the right tools and technology and management processes to do it effectively so that it, it that it's a win for the little guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. So great thoughts. Well, thank you again, Amber, for joining us, for making the trek down to Blue Earth. And thanks to Q, as usual, for your market insights. And I'd like to give a big shout out to our production crew. We've got Triple Falls Productions and Chris Parker at Self Made Glory. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next week.